Okay. Welcome back to my primer on Stars Without Number. The science fiction space role-playing game. Um, although you really could play this game without ever going into space um, with really uh, the barest hints of science fiction. But that's no fun. Well, maybe it could be fun. But anyways, so far we have talked about <laughs> the basic setting and making a character and rules for combat and uh, <clears throat> solving different situations and skill checks and so on and so forth, hacking, blah, blah, blah. But uh, although you could uh, start from there and get into a campaign, uh, there's some things you're still missing, and that is stuff, uh, objects, items, equipment, vehicles, uh, from laser rifles to mechs to the biggest starships imaginable. There's a lot of stuff that we get to talk about, so let's dive right into it. This should be fun. There's a lot, a lot of cool stuff in this game. So, um, to start off this very exciting section, there's encumbrance. Oh, that's very exciting. <clears throat> so, this is really, um, you know, there's a lot of RPG tables, uh, you know, groups that will throw out any and all encumbrance rules. They just don't care. They use, you know, common sense to just, you know... The GM is just like, no, you can't carry that much. That's ridiculous. Um, and most groups just use common sense to dictate exactly how much they can carry. Because most groups, I don't think, go too crazy with how much... They, they don't try to carry, you know, obscene amounts of stuff. It usually does not come up at our table. Um, other groups, uh, of course, are the opposite end of the spectrum. They're very specific... They want to be very realistic about how much each person can carry, often based on strength, um, and they relish all these rules for encumbrance. So, of course, you can throw out all this. None of this really needs to be in your game, but if you do like encumbrance rules, um, it is based on strength. Um, you can have a number of items readied or stowed based on your strength score. Um, you can burden yourself to take more than your strength score would normally allow, and this will reduce your movement rate per round. Um, and items all have encumbrance ratings to help you uh, understand and, and, you know, handle all the encumbrance stuff. Not going to go into detail. If you care about it, you can read that section. Money! <clears throat> so... The, uh, <laughs> of course, the principal currency of a science fiction galaxy is credits. So, um, this is really where it's like, just shut up, it's credits, just, that's what it is, deal with it. <laughs> you know, you've got all these different galaxies and planets and systems, and it's just like, it's credits. Um, so, for most worlds, you're just going to get used to having credits, spending credits, um, often in digital form, uh, electronic banking entries of credits, but there are physical chips or notes as well, so you could hand out physical credits, but often it's just going to be numbers on a paper, and that's good, but... Sometimes you'll be thrown for a loop and uh, credits will not be uh, accepted. This is most often on really primitive, isolated worlds um, that deal with barter, trading, uh, precious metals, stuff like that. Credits are meaningless to them because they just are not... They just do not have enough connection to modern civilizations they don't see credits often enough they have no way of handling credits you know they don't have computer systems 
They don't have anybody that can, like, print credits or, or anything like that. So it makes sense they would not take your credits. Uh, it's useless to them. So there are... There are trades that can happen. Um, and if your GM's a real dick, maybe you'll come to a planner and so like, We don't deal with credits. We deal with... Fedits. How many fedits do you... I don't know. Um, you never know. You never know. It's a big galaxy. Um, legalities, of course. Um, in a game with a lot of guns, there's probably going to be some rules about uh, who can carry guns. Um, how can you get guns? Who can blah, blah, blah. So, um, this just depends on the GM and depends on the world. Um... You know, there's frontier planets that are the wild, wild west. They expect you to have a gun on you. And then there are really civilized planets where it's perfectly illegal. <laughs> perfectly, yeah, it's just, you can't have a gun. What are you talking about? Um, this is, this is England. Um, so, you know, it depends on the situation. You got to look into it. And it also mentions that some... Worlds might have some really weird rules regarding some equipment that you can own and what you can't own. Uh, some worlds with unbreathable atmospheres restrict the possession of oxygen generation equipment in order to keep the air supplies firmly in the hands of the local rulers. Makes sense. So, laws are really just there for your GM to, to trip you up. And that's pretty much it. Forbidden science. So these are devices, any sort of device that breaks one of these three rules is forbidden um almost universally like practically no one wants these things to exist um and so really they're like adventure hooks and things like that for some madman to try and do this this forbidden science um so these are not things that are ever going to be purchasable on any planet or anything like that um these are tools that uh, enslave or control humans or humanity so anything mind control um, anything like that anything that that <sighs> eugenics designed to fundamentally enslave or control humanity um, true AIs a true unbraked AI is forbidden so, they do have AIs, of course, you can get, like, an AI for your ship computer that's not a true AI, it, it doesn't, like, it, it doesn't, like, have access to unlimited information and it learns and it's just unbridled intelligence. Um, they have, like, smart general AIs that could be true AIs that could learn anything, but they specifically program flaws into them called breaks that make them forget stuff and make them a little bit irrational that make them a little bit more human um so that they do not become this crazy true ai so anybody that makes anything that's a true ai with no flaws whatsoever that is forbidden and finally any device capable of planetary destruction is also forbidden um so there are of course devices such as nuclear missiles and stuff like that that can cause mass destruction but there are <coughs> there are devices in place on most civilized planets um, that will stop that from ever happening these are gravitic breaker emplacements nuke snuffers and quantum ecm <clears throat> so even though you can buy nukes um you can well, i mean we'll get to it in a little bit you can you can buy nukes um they're mostly useless on any civilized planet or attacking any ship because they all have nuke snuffers that will basically just like i don't know if it's ever explained how they work i assume they like they, they like prevent nuclear fission or something like that from ever occurring within a certain radius so they just make them into duds pretty much um and so yeah most planets and ships are protected from a lot of stuff but creating something that bypasses that and actually could destroy a planet is of course forbidden because that would be a big problem 
All right, so technology levels, we already went over this. Um, you don't have, I don't have to talk too much about this. Anything that's from before the, uh, the scream, the big psionic, uh, death that really messed up the galaxy is known as pre-tech. So, uh, pre-tech stuff is really valuable, uh, almost universally. Sometimes it's mass produced, but it's still not like run of the mill. Like, it's almost always something gonna, that's going to be better than anything else and therefore expensive. Um, some pre-tech stuff is really, really valuable. They don't know how to make it. They, It's just rare. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anything that's current, current, modern, up-to-date stuff is post-tech. So, you'll see those terms all over the place. Pre-tech is advanced stuff from before the screen. Post-tech is current stuff. That's sort of been put together based on... Uh, based on some understanding of how things were, you know, 700 years ago or whatever. But um, post-tech is not as good as pre-tech. Thus, it is a lower tech level. Okay, so armor. Um, armor comes in four main varieties... Uh, primitive armor, street armor, combat armor, and powered armor. So, primitive armor is anything that would be found on tech level 0 or 1 planets. Um, or really level 2 planets or... Um, yeah, pretty much that. <clears throat> this is leather... Um, this is anything you'd find in a D&D &D game, pretty much. Anything you'd find in a D&D &D game. Uh, leather, quilted, um, half plate, scale, full plate, all that stuff. All that stuff is primitive. So, a full plate armor gives you 17 armor class. Much as it would in, in, you know, a fantasy game. Um, uh, but unfortunately, it's pretty fucking useless against a laser rifle. I'm sorry. So... Uh, yeah, primitive armor is useless against TL4 melee weapons and firearms of all kinds. All kinds. So, even, uh, even a musket makes primitive armor useless. So you have AC-10, you have the, the uh, base armor class, as if you were not wearing any armor. Um, but there are some planets... That have native flora or fauna capable of naturally producing extremely effective armor materials. Um, not susceptible to this limitation. So yes, there might be a planet that makes special tree armor that only they can make. And it's like as strong as power armor or something like that. It, it's possible. But by default, primitive armor is primitive. Street armor is from post-tech. So this is modern armor that can be worn publicly without really anybody noticing or caring. So, this is stuff like an armored undersuit and clothing that has, like, Kevlar wo woven into it. Uh, stuff like that. <clears throat> this is, if you're trying to be a little bit subtle uh, and just walk around the street but have some protection, you're wearing street armor, probably. Um... Yeah, <clears throat> because if you're wearing something heavier than that, such as combat armor, um, that's very obvious, this is a sign to pretty much anybody that you are looking for trouble. Most people do not need to wear combat armor. They do not go into situations where they need combat armor. Uh, and even though... It might be a planet where it's perfectly fine to carry, like, a revolver or a pistol or something like that on your hip. Um, concealed carry or, or something like that. You can justify that by saying, oh, it's self-defense. You know, this is, it's, it's a dangerous, dangerous life, you know. I, I'm, I just have it for comfort and, um, 
for self-defense just in case. That might work as a justification. That will probably not work for something like combat armor because it's far more restrictive and uncomfortable. Um, it's a much bigger bother for a person so that no one would really believe that you'd be wearing security armor walking around if you did not really need it. So it, it just does not work. So if you're wearing stuff like that, if you're wearing combat armor, you're going to be drawing attention. Um, whether or not you care is another is another thing entirely. But yeah, so it's a step up. Obviously, it's more protective um, than street armor, but you're going to be getting noticed. So that's security armor, woven body armor, combat field uniforms, stuff like that. Finally, there's powered armor. Yes, it's as badass as you'd expect. So this stuff really ramps up the armor class um, to like 18 and 19. Um, it requires at least a month of training before it can be used effectively by any PC who hasn't got a background involving such experience, which is most people. Um, and while wearing any power armor, you are immune to primitive melee weapons, unarmed attacks, and any firearm or grenade scale explosives of tech level 3 or less. So, yeah, that includes, like, <laughs> that includes, um, like, our current weaponry in, on, on Earth. Like, combat shotguns, you are immune. A sniper rifle, you are immune. Uh, any revolver or grenade, you are immune to. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so then it goes into detail discussing all of the different armor... Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go into all this. There are um, there are some cool ones like the Icarus Harness. This is a combat armor. It costs 8,000 credits. It provides 16 armor class, so that's pretty good. Um, but notably, um, it provides a gravity damper. So you can fall an unlimited distance without harm. You can go, you can fall from like, like you can do a halo jump and hit the ground with no problem whatsoever. Um, and it just drains a, a type A power cell, which is not that big of a deal. I mean, you're gonna wanna have spares, of course, but still an unlimited distance without harm. That's really cool. Um, it's not often that you're going to be falling huge amounts of distance, I wouldn't think. But just the fact that you could take your spaceship uh, into, like, the lower atmosphere and you got, your whole team just jumps out with Icarus harnesses and lands on a building. It's just badass, man. Uh, it also functions as a, a vacuum suit. So that's cool. Um... Oh, yeah, Storm Armor. So this is one of the Powered Armor. This is a Tech Level 5. Most of the Powered Armors are Tech Level 5. This is advanced shit. Um, this is really cool, though. It's basically like a Crisis Suit or something. Um, it allows you to treat your strength as four points higher for encumbrance purposes. It allows you to leap up to 20 meters as a move action, either horizontally or vertically. And it allows you to fall up to 40 meters without suffering harm. It has an onboard medical computer that can stabilize you if all other efforts fail. That's it. But it's still, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> um, it's tech level 5, so it's rare. And the base cost is 20000 Which means, on a planet that makes them, like they have factories and stuff that make storm armor... It might cost 20000 Most of the time, you're not going to see it for that price. It's going to go for a lot more. Uh, these are just guidelines. So, I mean, 20000 e even like triple that, even like 60000 isn't an absurd amount. We're going to get into absurd amount of credits when we get to the Starship section. But, uh, yeah, you know, when a normal body armor costs like four 400 yeah, there's a big difference. But it's badass, man. Um, yeah, so there's some cool stuff there. Weaponry. Ranged weaponry. So, you of course have 
it, it's very cool because the system allows for such a big breadth of settings because you can have wor worlds that are cave that are just cavemen like they have no technology greater than like bows um or you can have planets that are using mag weaponry and stuff like that and you can bounce between these planets um so it allows for just all sorts of different settings it's really wide so you have stats of course for bows primitive bows or advanced bows or conversion bows which uh, conversion bows use the kinetic energy of the draw to glaze a force field around the arrow improving penetration so they do extra damage and they can shoot farther and they cost a lot more but still if, you, if you're on a world a modern world you're and you want a bow you're gonna get a conversion bow um so yeah primitive bow doing 1d6 damage nothing nothing too crazy about that then you have um like uh black powder uh like really primitive um firearms uh, muskets and um old school pistols I, I don't know the proper term but uh yeah the really old school primitive uh firearms a crude pistol is the same damage as a bow and it takes two main actions to reload and so it's really just like why not just fucking use a bow <laughs> um it's a good question isn't it i mean look look at compared to a bow it's got way less range it costs more takes two actions to reload and uh, it is less encumbrance i guess if you're using encumbrance rules maybe you care but I guess it's probably faster to shoot, but by the rules, it's not. Although maybe I don't know how the ready rules really work, so maybe not. Anyways, um, then you move up to revolvers and rifles. So these are your, uh, you know, tech level two era type stuff. Uh, you know, if you're doing some Red Dead kind of things going on, you might have some revolvers on you. I mean, hell, even if you're a modern man bouncing between planets, you might have a couple revolvers on you. Because really, 1d8 is not atrocious. It's not. Uh, I mean, compared to a mag pistol, I guess, which does 2d6 plus 2. Um, I mean, that's pretty good. But the thing with the revolver that they mention here is uh, revolvers are quite popular on frontier worlds as the weapons are extremely reliable and can be repaired and manufactured even by primitive metallurgists. Um, so yeah, if I was bouncing around between planets and I always wanted to make sure I had a functioning weapon, revolver is pretty reliable. And it's badass, I don't know. Maybe it's not the best, but screw you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you go through the gamut of shotguns, submachine guns, combat rifles, sniper rifles. Um, getting to the modern stuff, you have uh, void carbines. These are designed for vacuum environments. They have no recoil. Um, their rounds cannot penetrate ordinary ship equipment plating. I don't know why you'd mention that. I thought most... Oh, no, I guess you can. I don't know what those rules are, but that's not going to happen too often. Um, the magnetic weaponry, mag pistol, mag rifle, um, they use magnetic acceleration. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The spike thrower is like a shotgun that uses magnetic acceleration. It does 3d8 damage, which is the highest amount on this list. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, the laser weapons, like I said, since they have no recoil, they get plus one to attack, or to hit. Um, 
Although, if you're shooting through uh, a thick cloud of thermally resistant particulate matter, such as ash or sand, uh, it can do a negative four penalty to hit and cut the range in half. Because that affects the beam. Uh, thermal, pistol, plasma projector are pretty much better laser weapons. Um, but they have shorter range. And they're really loud. If you if your GM actually remembers that, they're really loud. <clears throat> um, then you get into the tech level 5 stuff, so this is not going to be very common. Sheer rifles uh, cause dangerous repulsor fields inside a target, tearing it apart. Um, Thunder gun <laughs> makes... Uh, Uses grav plates to create rapid, randomized disruptions in a target. Um, this is really good against inanimate targets. Because <sighs> um, it always done, it does an extra 1d10 damage. So it really does 3d10 damage on inanimate targets. That's pretty good. And then finally, a distortion cannon. These are not going to be common in your campaign. I almost guarantee it. Um... So, yeah, it sort of just fucks things up. It can ignore a meter of solid cover. And it does 2d12 damage. It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, melee weapons, I already went over these. Uh, <clears throat> small, medium, large, primitive, or advanced. You also have the stun baton. You know what that is. Uh, and the suit ripper. These are weapons used specifically to rip vacuum suits. Uh, it does 1d6 damage, um, but I think normally when you attack, when you get attacked while wearing a vacuum suit, there's like a 50% chance that a tear occurs, but with a suit ripper it always occurs. Uh, and so as soon as it rips, you are, <clears throat> you have to go to those hard vacuum rules. So yeah, you could lose consciousness immediately. So, uh, unsurprisingly, these weapons are strictly illegal in space environments. Yeah, of course. Then you have the heavy weaponry. Yeah, this is what you, uh, this is, this is some badass shit. These are all your heavy machine guns, you know, that you'd expect from our world. The big, uh, vehicle-mounted machine guns. You've got rocket launchers. And demo charges, those are all just sort of wrapped up in these three things. Um, those are tech level three, so these you are all pretty familiar with. Railgun, <clears throat> these are just bigger versions of the magnetic rifles. So, magnetic acceleration on big metal slugs. Um, and it shoots out a lot of them, so you can use it to suppress which means you fire double the amount of ammunition, um, but every target that's not behind hard cover is automatically hit for half normal damage. Unless they make a successful evasion throw. I also skipped um, talking about burst mode. <clears throat> so some of these weapons that you see have an asterisk, such as the combat rifle. Um, they can fire in burst mode, so they fire three rounds of ammunition, and they get plus two bonus to hit and damage. That's pretty much it. It's pretty simple. <clears throat> so this game does very much track your ammo. Um, this is not just, it's not like Dungeon World or something like that, where it's just like, it's sort of an abstraction. You sometimes have to worry about it, but not really. It's like, no, you're, you're counting bullets here. So keep track of magazine size and, and all that good stuff. Um, what else? What else? Anti-vehicle lasers. Obviously useful against vehicles. Hydra arrays are basically like... They're, they're just multi-rocket launchers that you can uh, zero in on some targets. Wheat cutter belts. Um, it's a belt of explosives firing off a scything blast of shrapnel. So it's basically like a strip of claymores on a side of a vehicle. This is just pure sadistic riot control. 
It's brilliant. Um, so yeah, that's good. And then Vortex Cannons, which are as cool as they sound. They use controlled gravitic shear planes to cause a target to simply fall apart into component fragments. And they're silent. Nice. 5d12 damage. That'll fuck your day up real fast. Okay. Um, general equipment. So, you have, um, you have ammo. This is stuff you'd expect. Um, ammunition for regular guns is shared across all guns. There are no calibers or anything like that you have to worry about. It's just ammo. You know, it's like, it's like when a character goes into a bar and says, just, I'll take a beer. It's just all ammo. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but missiles are different, of course. Then you have power cells A and B. Um, so B, B type are bigger and cost more. Type A power cells power equipment and weapons and armor. Mm, maybe not armor. Oh, uh, yeah, some armor. Uh, that require power cells. Um, power cell type B is used for, like, vehicles and stuff like that. Power cell type A, um, recharge in like half an hour or something like that. Yeah, and type B requires 24 hours. So you can recharge them, you know, at a, any sort of outlet, I guess, uh, or on your spaceship, uh, or stuff like that. Or you can buy a solar charger if you're out in the middle of nowhere, as long as you have the sun, a sun. Uh, or you can get a telekinetic chart generator, um, which someone with telekinesis can use pretty easily. Uh, but you can also use it manually, like a big dumb ox. And uh, but you have to do a skill check, and uh, that's not great. But uh, the solar charger is actually pretty shit because it's one Type A power cell per day. But hey, if you're on some lost world for like a week and you've got all your laser guns or something you might be glad you brought a solar recharger so don't knock it uh what else do we got comm servers compad field radio translator torque comm server again on most planets comm server is sort of just built in you know cell phone towers and all that stuff it's just part of the the infrastructure you don't have to worry about it but if you're on a planet that has never seen a cell phone, they're not going to have communication towers built up. Uh, and so you can set up a little comm server, which functions as basically a cell phone tower um, within 300 kilometers. So it's pretty useful if you need communication while you're on some backwater planet. Compad is pretty much your cell phone. That, that's it. Field radio, you know what that is. Translator torque, it's like um, a, a babblefish or whatever. It, it allows you to translate any language between two people, um, but it's done on a delay, so it's not great. You take a negative two penalty if you're trying to do any charismatic skill check using it. Um, computing gear, here you see the line shunts are 100 credits. Um, data slab, that's basically a laptop. Um, the black slab, this is like your hacking laptop. This is your cyber deck, so that's 10,000 credits. Um, a data phase tap. Oh, this allows you to tap... This allows you to tap into da data lines without directly touching them. Um, so, up to 10 centimeters away. Oh, no, up to five, uh, 5 meters away through up to 10 centimeters of wall. So, yeah. I mean, if you're hacking into a facility, you might not want to break down a wall in order to get into a data line that's running through it. So, that could be pretty useful. But there are 5,000 credits, so that's half the cost of a black slab. Um, remote link unit. I think that's similar to... 
Yeah, it allows you to maintain a connection with a remote data storage unit. Um, because again, the whole wireless thing is a little wonky, so they have remote link units if you really care about maintaining wireless connections. Oh, stiletto charge. These are cool. This is basically a flash drive from the golden age of humanity that allows you to automatically succeed on a hacking attempt. Just, you plug it in, boom, you are hacked in. No skill check necessary on any system. It's amazing. It's amazing. But make sure you use a line shunt because uh, otherwise it's still only 1d4 rounds. Uh, it's still temporary without a line shunt. So, yeah, guaranteed success. These things are ridiculously valuable, of course. There's no cost li listed here. Um... They are prized so highly that they are almost unavailable, almost always unavailable for conventional purchase, of course. Um, so you might be given these as rewards for certain things, or you might find them in some long lost ruins. Um, but yeah, those, those are fucking valuable. I'd be worried if I was playing a hacker that had one. I'd be worried it would be kind of like a, like a mega elixir or something in, in a role-playing game in like Final Fantasy where it'd be like, should I use it? No, but I might really need it later, you know? Guaranteed success. That That's that's wild. Um, storage unit is just extra storage in case you really need to download an entire big database. And then um, type beam link unit. Um uses a laser to connect via line of sight transmission um again it's sort of bypassing this whole wireless thing um what else do we got here pharmaceuticals so these are all your drugs I'm not gonna go into these too much because um uh, a lot of them do stuff you might expect um a bunch of them cause system strain so this is sort of the, it's sort of the system um, equivalent to Essence in Shadowrun. Because um, this also goes with Cyberware. So you have a number of system strain available to your character equal to your constitution score. And so Cyberware, as we'll get to in a bit, maybe... <laughs> Um, deducts from your overall system strain. So you can't have just abundant amount of cyberware, of course. Um, but drugs, often drugs, will also add system strain to you. And I think if you ever OD, you just go unconscious, I think. Something like that. So, yeah, some of these add one system strain, some add two um, things like that. Some make you better at combat, some keep you awake. This is a truth serum. There's a lot of stuff in here you'd probably expect. So I'm not going to go over all that. Uh, tools and medical gear. Bioscanner lets you um, scan for injuries, diseases, genetic stuff, toxins, all sorts of stuff like that. Lazarus patch. This I mentioned before. This allows you to stabilize somebody better than almost anything else. Unless you're a bio scion. Um, so you're going to want to have these available to you. Let's look at the price. The price of one Lazarus patch, the baseline, is 30 credits. So, yeah, if they're available to you, your medic should be having a lot of those. Even if you have a bio scion on your group. You know, what if he goes down? Um, but yeah, so those are good. Med kit, uh, those are you're familiar with. Meta tool, this is basically like a multi tool for uh, engineers and hackers and all sorts of stuff like that. It's got a bunch of little things with it. Spare parts, um, this is just a generic thing. Um, you might need spare parts for fixing or building or things like that. Um, tailored anti allergens, these allow you to. 
um, breathe an atmosphere or eat local flora or fauna that would normally cause severe al allergic reactions. Um, it's probably not... I mean, maybe one character that's really, like, paranoid and likes to be prepared might have some of these on them, but most of the time you're probably going to purchase that in, in preparation, I think. Uh, and then a toolkit you're familiar with. Field equipment. There's all sorts of stuff here. Uh, Atmo filter lets you filter out toxins, backpacks, binoculars, climbing harnesses. Glowbug is a palm-sized disc. Can adhere to any non-porous surface, and it emits a big, bright light. Grapnel launcher. This is not a word you see too often. Grapnel. I mean, it, most people just say, like, a grappling hook launcher or something, but grapnel. I looked it up. That It's acceptable. Um, grab shoot. This is basically like an advanced parachute. Um... It slows your falling speed for up to a thousand meters, and uh, the advanced version of it allows you to fall from orbital heights and costs a thousand credits, and they burn out after one use. They're good if you can't find an Icarus harness, but, I mean, come on. Um, the Grav harness allows for clumsy flight, so it's kind of like a jetpack. Instapanel lets you set up a panel that... Um, can basically like resist some damage um yeah that's not much else to say vacuum suit um they have a self-healing exterior that can seal the puncture wounds caused by bullets arrows or energy beams but a strike from an edged weapon can overwhelm the repair system um if you have 10 or fewer hit points and you're struck by an edge weapon, there's a 50% chance the suit is torn. So, that's how it is. But if you have a suit ripper, it will guarantee, no matter what, rip it open. That's scary, man. I mean... Like, if you're on some... If you're on a station or something like that and you're all in vacuum suits and some crazed man rushes at you with some suit rippers and... Whew, scary. Um, yeah, okay. Then they go into all the lifestyles. So this is your cost per day of, like, living somewhere. Um, yeah, again, it's sort of abstracted and simplified. So you just say, I want a, I want a common lifestyle for the next month while we're on this planet. It's like, okay, it's 15 credits a day and blah, blah, blah. So you don't have to worry about, you know, your housing costs, your food costs, all that stuff. It's just bundled up um that's not anything crazy new sometimes you'll hire help so you might need to hire a prostitute um this is the cost per day of hiring a prostitute and the different levels are based on their um skill level <laughs> their uh their their applicable relevant skill level so a prostitute that's not too good at whoring only costs two credits a day that's pretty good Considering, like, rations for a day cost five credits. Two credits for a shitty whore. <laughs> but if you want an okay whore, ten credits a day. And then it jumps up, like, quite a bit. Twenty times extra for the best of whores. So, yeah. So that goes for doctors or lawyers or technicians. Um, unskilled labor. There you go. Um, and then services like renting a car, uh, passage on a starship if you don't own one, throwing a party, bribes for different crimes, so on and so forth. Vehicles. So this is any vehicle that <laughs> is not a starship because, again, starships have very specific rules. So these are your motorcycles, your cars, your hover cars, um, helicopters... Um, your traditional, like, fixed-wing planes, um, your grav flyers, all that stuff. This is all wrapped up in here. So, if you just want a regular old motorcycle, badass, thousand credits, it's pretty simple. 
Um, whereas if you want a grav tank for some crazy operation you're pulling, that's 200,000. But that's the base price, and not many places are just going to sell you a grav tank <laughs> for the base price with no questions asked. So, you know, these are guidelines. You can probably buy a used motorcycle for 300 credits. Um, so they contain, they have the speed info. This is not, um, this is not some absolute measurement. This is an abstraction, of course, um, because <laughs> a ground car does not really have zero speed. Um, it is not immobile. Um, these are relative to one another. So, um, when comparing, in like a chase or, or a race, when comparing a motorcycle to a ground car, the motorcycle will always be faster, just assuming these numbers. Now, of course, things can change those numbers, modifications and all sorts of stuff, but um, by default, a motorcycle is just one step faster than a ground car, um, whereas a grav car is two steps faster than a ground car. Um, yeah, there's armor. Um, so this subtracts from any damage done to it. Um, except if you're using heavy weaponry, which ignores vehicle armor, which makes it a lot better. Um, and also, um, grav tanks, as you can see, special, they are immune to anything short of tech level four heavy weapons. So... Your 50 caliber machine gun will do jack shit to a grav tank. You, you gotta have some, some cool shit. Um, but it also mentions... Uh, sophisticated tanks. I assume this means, like, our current tanks, I would guess. Oh, less sophisticated tanks. Yeah, so, like, our current tanks... Are immune to anything below tech level three heavy ordnance. So, um, like a combat shotgun would do nothing to a, a modern tank. Um, hit points, those are what you'd expect. Again, this is all to have like ubiquity between different OSR systems and things like that. Um, so you can have a pack of wolves to go against a car, <laughs> I guess. Um, crew. This is the maximum number of occupants that can fit inside the, uh, inside the vehicle. So obviously a motorcycle has one. Five people can fit inside a ground car. Uh, eight people can fit inside an ATV Explorer. Tonnage is the weight of the vehicle by default. Tech level is the minimum tech level to make it. So on and so forth. Talks about uh, putting weapons on, on or in a vehicle. So on and so forth. Drones, um, so they have different types, as you can see, different models from primitive drones, which are like our current quadcopters and stuff. Um, and then you've got all sorts of different ones that are capable of um, underwater movement, stealth modes, um, some that have more fittings. So they can um, carry more weapons or different uh, different capabilities. Some have higher armor class and are designed for combat. Uh, so on and so forth. More HP, blah, blah, blah. Ghost Walker has one HP. Oh, that's a stealth drone. Yeah. They're hard to spot. Um, so yeah, you can pilot drone either using a handheld control system or a uh, control link, which is a cybernetic implant. Um, so here's all the fittings for a drone that you can throw into it, which includes uh, weapon fittings, of course, and ammos to go with that. Um, make things quieter, or they can lift more. They have medical support. Uh, they're reinforced. All sorts of fun stuff there. Drones are pretty cool. Um, not obscenely expensive. Obviously, the Electo Tech Level 5 combat drone is going to be pretty expensive, but 
you know, having a little stealth drone that can record and see stuff is it's not terribly expensive. Um, with an observation suite. Camera and sound. Full. Oh, all drones are wired for basic camera and sound. Oh, you don't even need that. But this suite contains a full spectrum UV, IR, visual package, remote sound sensors, and radiation chemical detectors. Ooh, that's kind of useful. You send that ahead of you to see if there's, you know, a lot of radiation. That's not bad. Can operate even in the complete absence of visible light. There you go. Yeah, you might want to have a drone with you if you're heading to some radiation shithole. Um, cyberware. Yeah, you know, it, like I said, you could have a game that's just a cyberpunk game using stars without number. And, you know, there's no spaceship travel or anything like that. You're just doing cyberspace, cy cyberpunk stuff. I think there's a supplement that goes into cyberpunk even more and talks about, like, megacorps and stuff. Uh, so cyberware is not... Um, not entirely common. Uh, it's rarely available on most worlds. Um, it's expensive. And most people are not going to have it. But there are some good things here. Um, body arsenal array. 10 grand. This allows you to have retractable body weaponry. That's pretty good. Uh, dermal armor. 20 grand. It gives you AC 16. Immune to primitive weapon shock. Um, gecko anchors, 15 grand. Can climb sheer surfaces if they were flat. That's pretty nice. Um, identity submersion trigger, 25 grand. Allows a false identity to be, to be perfectly assumed. Uh, immune to almost all diseases and poisons. That's pretty good. Integral low light and thermal vision. You know, there's it's cyberware. You, you all know what it does and what it's capable of. So, yeah. This is just a basic list. Uh, you could come up with anything, of course, and I'm sure the GM will see if it's possible, but you might have to travel to a certain system, to a certain planet, to a certain city uh, to find someone that can do it for you, but it's in the galaxy somewhere. Uh, I'm not going to go over it because, uh, yeah. Artifacts. So, these are... <laughs> These are essentially magic items. Uh, in, in any other system, of course, these would be like the really powerful magic artifacts. Um, these are stuff that's from the, the pre-tech. These are from the golden age of humanity. And these are pretty much never purchased on any open market. These are held privately or they're lost, waiting to be found, stuff like that. These are adventure hooks, you know, rarely talked about. You, you, you would have a whole adventure based around one of these items. Um, and they're really cool, um, but they are rare. And so there's artifact armor, weaponry, and equipment. Um, and so you'd have like... Like here, the Titan-powered armor. An enormously heavy suit of servo-actuated powered armor. Titan assault plate was favored by pre-tech boarding parties and space marines. It grants the wearer all the usual benefits of storm armor, but has a base AC of 21 and subtracts two points of damage from every instance of harm suffered by the wearer. That's pretty good. <laughs> a base AC of 21 uh, modified by your dex. And subtracts two points of damage from every instance of harm. That's pretty good. But, you know, let's say you go through a whole adventure. And you go through some crazy ancient ruin that has all these, like, booby traps and, like, turrets and robot. Who knows what? And in the end, you guys, your, your team, finds one suit of Titan-powered armor. It's like, okay, that's pretty great. Um, you could sell it for probably a pretty insane amount of money. But I don't think most groups would do that. They would probably wear it. Um, and it would cause one person on the team to be incredibly well protected. Um, 
I mean, if you wear it uh, openly, there's going to be people um, probably trying to kill you uh, to get it. This is going to be a pretty obvious thing. And it doesn't make you immortal. You know, if an army or something goes up against you, they're going to they're gonna blow you the fuck up. Like, you're not immortal or invincible or anything. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I like it. It's It's just really powerful stuff, which is in a lot of games, but it's really rare, and you're not going to have an abundance of it. The artifact weaponry, this is more stuff that's closer to, like, a plus one magic sword. Like, a lot of this artifact weaponry is stuff that gives, like, bonuses to hit and damage rolls. Like, you can see almost every one of these has some sort of bonus. This is plus three to hit and damage rolls, which is quite a bit. Um, plus two to hit and damage rolls. A lot of these give that. Um, and also a bunch of them have other little bonuses. Um, like Imperial Arms, if you find one of these guns. Um, if it's a projectile weapon, it has an unlimited supply of ammo. That's pretty good. That's a nice little bonus. So, these are a little bit more basic, most of them. Um, and if you find one, you probably give it to your best, like, shooter. Or something like that. Um, so it's not as big of a deal as, like, a Titan-powered armor. But, you know, there's a few things in here that are pretty unique. Uh, and then you get to the artifact equipment. These are some fun stuff. AI companion. Um. So, these are really smart AIs. Smarter than anything commonly available. And it's, uh... <laughs> These, these are human-level intelligence that have their own personalities, and um, they s stick with somebody. And they have program and fix skills at level 3 or greater with maybe additional capabilities, which is cool. Um, but they also, um, you know, they could cause some, some problems. Who knows? It's an AI companion. It's kind of interesting. Um, super stim packs, um, a mind wall helmet that's like, it's like Juggernaut's helmet or something like that. It just protects him, protects him from telepathy and stuff. Um, pseudo nukes. So you remember I mentioned that nuclear weapons, um, are pretty useless most of the time because of the nuke snuffers. So you're not really dropping nukes on planets or sh shooting them at other ships because they just, they don't work. They get snuffed. But a pseudo-nuke was designed um, to sort of bypass this stuff. It, it just works differently. And so it can wipe out a large city or space station. Uh, <laughs> those that survive are spectacularly illegal on almost all worlds. So, yeah, because most people in the galaxy do not fear nuclear weapons anymore because they're just constantly protected by nuke snuffers. It's, it's not a possibility anymore. Um, so having a weapon, a nuke that can bypass that, um, the size of a briefcase, yeah, that's a really scary thing. So depending on the players, that could be really cool or really horrible. There you go. Um... Yeah, so, other stuff. Wide Awake Serum. Um, keeps you wide awake for up to seven days at a time. You don't even need to rest. Um, nice. Um, then it talks about modding and building equipment and gear and things like that, which I'm not going to go all the way over here. This is just more rules you don't need to know. But there are a bunch of sample mods listed here that you can build into weapons and armor and stuff that are really handy. Um, like this, auto-targeting. It just adds plus one bonus to hit rolls with a gun. Why would you not want that built onto your gun? So having an engineer or, you know, like a tinkerer that can make these mods um, is really good. Somebody with fix two and you've got 4,000 credits, it's great. It takes time. Uh, it takes a lot of time, but... Traveling through space 
takes a lot of time in this game. It is not instantaneous. So, yeah, having someone that can just sit around and tinker with your gun and make it better, it's really good. Uh, or stuff like this, Infinite Magazine, um, that just makes its own physical ammunition. Costs 10,000 credits and two units of pre-tech salvage. So, yeah, some mods require special salvage from pre-tech devices and stuff. Um, that's usually not available to purchase, um, so it's trickier to find. And it could very easily just be like a mission reward or something like that from the GM. It's like, yeah, here's some pre-tech salvage. Uh, and so deciding exactly what to do with it, because you could sell it for a bunch of money, I'm sure. Um, or you could do some pretty sweet mods with it on certain people's guns or armor you can make armor that automatically seals uh whenever it detects low pressure so you're never caught in like a vacuum accidentally um that's pretty nice um or you can have armor that shifts in appearance to that of normal clothing or different armor um so you could have like combat armor that looks like normal clothing that's very useful of course so, mods are pretty cool, and when we get to Starship mods, it gets even cooler. Speaking of Starships, of course, that is what we'll be talking about next time. Um, probably the coolest section of the book. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some, some wild stuff uh, coming next time. Very cool stuff. Obviously, it's a very important section of the game. For most people's campaigns, there's going to be starships and space travel. So it's important and it's cool. What more do you want? All right. My name is Mang. Game you're watching is a bit... No, not game you're watching. I'm sorry. I've been talking a lot. This has been a primer on Stars Without Number, which is... It is a game, but you haven't really been watching it. But uh, this has been a primer on Stars Without Number. And I'll see you fine folks in the next part.